All right, guys, so this is the uh, last video of eight. We've been looking at J.C. Riles, a little book on reading the Bible. He's given us eight different reflections on the significance and importance of reading the Bible. I pray the Spirit has used his um, explication of the various passages of Scripture to encourage your hearts to bring about fruits of repentance and faith in your life. Here we are in the conclusion where he gives us Lots of practical advice. Remember, uh, this is going to be a little bit longer, so just stick with me. Let's read. I have now given the reasons why I press on every reader the duty and importance of reading the Bible. I have shown that no book is written in such a manner as the Bible, that knowledge of the Bible is absolutely necessary to salvation, that no book contains such matter, that no book has done so much for the world generally, that no book can do so much for everyone who reads it aright, that this book is the only rule of faith and practice, that it is and always has been the food of all true servants of God, and that it is the only book which can comfort men when they die. All these are ancient things. I do not pretend to tell anything new. I have only gathered together old truths and tried to mold them into a new shape. Let me finish all by addressing a few plain words to the conscience of every class of readers. Uh, number one, this paper may fall into the hands of some who can read but never do read the Bible at all. Are you one of them? If you are, I have something to say to you. I cannot comfort you in your present state of mind. It would be mockery and deceit to do so. I cannot speak to you of peace in heaven while you treat the Bible as you do. You are in danger of losing your soul. You are in danger because you have neglected the Bible as a plain, you, because your, your neglected Bible is a plain evidence that you do not love God. The health of a man's body may generally be known by his appetite. The health of a man's soul may be known by his treatment of the Bible. Now you are manifestly laboring under a sore soul disease. Will you not repent? I know I cannot reach your heart. I cannot make you see and feel these things. I can only enter my solemn protest against your present treatment of the Bible and lay that protest before your conscience. I do so with all my soul. Oh, beware, lest you repent too late. Beware, lest you put off reading the Bible until you send for the doctor in your last illness, and then find the Bible a sealed book and dark as the cloud between the hosts of Israel and Egypt to your anxious soul. Beware, lest you go on saying all your life, men do very well without the Bi all this Bible reading, and find at length to your cost that men do very ill and end up in hell. Beware lest the day comes when you feel, quote, had I but honored the Bible as much as I have honored the newspaper, I would not have been left without comfort in my last hours. Bible neglecting reader, I give you a plain warning. The plague, plague mark is at present on your door. May the Lord have mercy upon your soul. Number two, this paper may fall into the hands of someone who is willing to begin reading the Bible, but wants advice on the subject. Are you that man? Listen to me and I will give you a few short hints. In the first, the one thing, begin reading your Bible this very day. The way to do a thing is to do it, and the way to read the Bible is actually to read it. It is not merely meaning or wishing or resolving or intending or thinking about it which will advance you one step. You must positively read. There is no royal road in this matter any more than in the matter of prayer. If you cannot read yourself, you must persuade someone else to read it to you. But one way or another, through eyes or ears, the words of Scripture must actually pass before your mind. There is a great resource in the ESV Bible online. You can actually get it read audio. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. In the second place, read the Bible with an earnest desire to understand it. Do not think for a moment that the great object is to turn over a certain quantity of printed paper and that it matters nothing whether you understand it or not. Some ignorant people seem to imagine that all is done if they advance so many chapters every day, although they may not have a notion of what they are all about, and only know that they have pushed it on their bookmark ahead of so many pages. This is turning Bible reading into mere ritual form. It is almost as bad as the popish habit of buying indulgences. 
by saying an astounding number of Ave Marias and Paternosters. It reminds us of the poor Hottentot who ate up a Dutch hymn book because he saw it comforted his neighbors' hearts. Settle it down in your mind as a general principle that the Bible not understood is a Bible that does no good. Say to yourself often as you read it, what is this all about? Dig for the meaning like a man digging for gold. Now, this doesn't contradict what I said, read it to be familiar with it. Use the Reformation Study Bible, which has little footnotes for the little odds and ends that pop up that it causes you to go, what? And you can get a real quick piece of advice and continue reading. In the third, read the Bible with childlike faith and humility. Open your heart as you open God's book and say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Resolve to believe implicitly whatever you find there, however much of it uh, may run counter to your own desires and prejudices. Resolve to receive heartily every statement of truth, whether you like it or not. Beware of that miserable habit into which some readers of the Bible fall. They receive some doctrines because they like them, and they reject others because they are condemning to themselves or to some relation or friend. At this rate, the Bible is useless. Are we to be judges of what ought to be in God's word? Do we know better than God? Settle it down in your mind that you will receive all and believe all, and that what you cannot understand you will take on trust. Remember when you pray that you are speaking to God and God hears you. But remember when you read scripture that God is speaking to you, and you are not to dictate but to listen. In the fourth place, read the Bible in a spirit of obedience and self-application. Sit down to study the study of it with a daily determination that you will live by its rules, rest on its statements, and act on its commands. Consider as you travel through every chapter, how does this affect my thinking and daily conduct? What does this teach me? This is what we talk about when we say think about it in terms of sin, savior, and salvation. It is a poor work to read the Bible for mere curiosity and for the speculative purposes in order to fill your head and store your mind with mere opinions while you do not allow the book to influence your heart and life. The, the, that Bible is read best, which is practiced most. In the fifth place, read the Bible daily. Make it a part of every day's business to read and meditate on some portion of God's Word. Private means of grace are just as needful every day for our soul as food and clothing for our bodies. Yesterday's food will not feed the laborer today, and today's food will not feed the laborer tomorrow. Do as the Israelites did in the wilderness. Gather your manna fresh every morning. Choose your own seasons and hours. Do not scramble over and hurry your reading. Give your Bible the best, and not the worst part of your time. By whatever plan you pursue, let it be a rule for your life that you to visit the throne of grace in God's word every day. That would be your own personal worship time, and then this Bible reading time. In the sixth, read all of the Bible and read it in an orderly way. I fear there are many parts of the which some people never read at all. This is to say, at the least, it is very presumptuous habit. All scriptures are profitable, 2 Timothy 3.16. To this habit may be traced the lack of well-proportioned views of truth, which are so common in this day. Some people's Bible reading is a system of perpetual dipping and picking. They do not seem to have an idea of regularly going through the whole book. This is also a great mistake. No doubt in times of sickness and affliction, it is allowable to search out reasonable, seasonable portions. But with this exception, I believe it is by far the best plan to begin the Old and New Testaments at the same time. Or as I'm recommending, begin at the Old and just keep going until you get done the New. To read each straight through to the end and then begin again. This is a matter for which everyone must be persuaded in his own mind. I can only say it has been my own plan for nearly 40 years, and I've never seen cause to alter it. For another thing, this is the seventh, read the Bible fairly and honestly. Determine to take everything in its plain and obvious meaning, and regard all forced interpretations with great suspicion. As a general rule, whatever a verse of the Bible seems to mean, it does mean. Cecil's rule is a very valuable one. The right way of interpreting Scripture is to take it as we find it, without any attempt to force it into any particular theological system. We would add to this reading the Bible in a scripture-interpreting scripture sense. If you're reading an unclear passage, a clearer passage will be brought to mind by the Spirit to explain it to you. And then last, in the eighth, read the Bible with Christ continually in view. The grand primary object of all scriptures is to testify of Jesus. 
Old Testament ceremonies are shadows of Christ. Old Testament deliverers are types of Christ. Old Testament prophecies are full of Christ's sufferings and of Christ's glories yet to come. The first coming and the second, the Lord's humiliation and his glorious kingdom, the, his cross and crown, shine forth everywhere in the Bible. Keep fast hold on this clue if you would read the Bible aright. I might easily add to these hints, if space permitted, few and short as they are, you will find them most profitable and implemented. The book satisfies and feeds his soul. A poor Christian woman once said to an infidel, I am no scholar, I cannot argue like you, but I know that honey is honey because it leaves a sweet taste in my mouth. And I know the Bible to be God's book because of the taste it leaves in my heart. Next point. This Bible may fall into the hands of someone who loves and believes the Bible. Remember, we began with some who never read it, some who ignore it, and now some who love it. And yet it and yet reads it but little. I fear there are I fear there are many such in this day. It is a day of hustle and bustle. It is a day of talking and committee meetings and public work. These things are all very well in their place, but I fear that they sometimes clip and cut short the private reading of the Bible. Does your conscience tell you that you are one of the people I speak of? Listen to me and I will say a few things which deserve your serious attention. You are the man who is likely to get little comfort from the Bible in time of need. Trial is a sifting season. Affliction is a searching wind which strips the leaves off the trees and brings to light the birds' nests. Now I fear that your stores of Bible consolations may one day run very low. I fear lest you find yourself at last on very short allowance and come into harbor weak, worn, and thin. You are the man that is likely never to be established in the truth. I should not be surprised to hear that you are troubled with doubts and questionings about assurance, grace, faith, perseverance, and the like. The devil is an old and cunning enemy. Like the Benjamites, he can throw stones at a hair breadth and not miss, Judges 2016. He can quote scripture readily enough when he pleases. Now, you are not sufficiently ready with your weapons to be able to fight a good fight with him. Your armor does not fit you well. Your sword sits loosely in your hand. You are the man that is likely to make mistakes in life. I shall not wonder if I am told that you have erred about your own marriage, erred about your children's education, erred about the conduct of your household, erred about the company you keep. The, word, the world you steer through is full of rocks and shoals and sandbanks. You are not sufficiently familiar either with the lights or charts. You are the man who is likely to be carried away by some specious false teacher for a season. It will not surprise me if I hear one of those clever, eloquent men who can make the worst appear the better cause is leading you into many follies. You are lacking in ballast. No wonder if you are tossed to and fro like a cork on the waves. All these are uncomfortable things. I want every reader of this paper to escape them all. Take the advice I offer you this day. Do not merely read your Bible a little, but read it a great deal. Quote, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, Colossians 3.16. Do not be a mere babe in spiritual knowledge. Seek to become, quote, well instructed in the kingdom of heaven and to be continually adding new things to old. A religion of mere feeling is an uncertain thing. It is like the tide, sometimes high and sometimes low. It is like the moon, sometimes bright and sometimes dim. A religion of Bible knowledge is a firm and lasting possession. It enables a man not merely to say, I feel hope in Christ, but I know whom I have believed. 2 Timothy 1.12 Another big point. This paper may fall into the hands of someone who reads the Bible much, and yet imagines that he is no better for his reading. This is a crafty temptation of the Bible. At one stage, he says, do not read the Bible at all. At another says, your reading does you no good. Give it up. Are you that man? I feel for you from the bottom of my soul. Let me try to do you good. Do not think you are getting no good from the Bible merely because you do not see that good day by day. The greatest effects are not by means those we are effects are by no means those which make the most noise and are most easily observed. The greatest effects are often silent, quiet, and hard to detect at the time they are being produced. Think of the influence of the moon upon the earth and all of the air upon human lungs. Remember how silently the dew falls and how imperfectly, the, imperceptibly, the grass grows. There may be far more happening than you think in your soul by your Bible reading. 
the word may be gradually producing deep impressions on your heart of which you are not at present aware. Often when the memory is retaining no facts, the character of a man is receiving some everlasting impression. Is sin becoming every year more hateful to you? Is Christ becoming every year more precious? Is holiness becoming every year more lovely and desirable in your eyes? If these things are so, take courage. The Bible is doing you good, though you may not be able to trace it out day by day. The Bible may be restraining you from some sin or delusion into which you would otherwise run. It may be daily keeping you back, hedging you up, preventing many a false step. Ah, you might soon find this out at your, to your cost if you were to cease reading the word. The very familiarity of blessings sometimes makes us insensible to their value. Resist the devil. Settle it down in your mind as an established rule that whenever you feel it at the moment or not, you are inhaling spiritual health by reading the Bible and insensibly becoming more strong. Another person. This paper may fall into the hands of someone who really loves the Bible, lives upon the Bible, and reads it much. Are you one of these? Give me your attention. Now I'll mention a few things which we shall do well to lay to heart for time to come. Let us resolve to read the Bible more and more every year we live. Let us try to get it rooted in our memories and grafted into our hearts. Let us be thoroughly well provisioned with it against the voyage of death. Who knows, but we may have a very stormy passage. Sight and hearing may fail us, and we may be in deep waters. Oh, that the word hidden in our hearts would be in such an hour as that. Psalm 119.11 Let us resolve to be more watchful over our Bible reading every year that we live. Let us be jealously careful about the time we give to it and the manner to that and the manner that time is spent. Let us beware of omitting our daily reading without sufficient cause. Let us not be gaping and yawning and dozing over God's book while we read. Let us read like a wife reading a husband's letter from a distant land. Let us be very careful that we never exalt any minister or sermon or book or tract or friend above the word. Cursed be that book or tract or human counsel which creeps in between us and the Bible and hides the Bible from our eyes. Once more I say, let us be very watchful. The moment we open the Bible, the devil sits down by our side. Oh, to read with a hungry spirit and a simple desire for edification. Let us honor, let us resolve to honor the Bible more in our families. Let us read it in morning and evening to our families and not be ashamed to let others see that we do so. Let us not be discouraged by seeing no good arise from it. The Bible reading in a family has kept many a one from the jail, the workhouse, and the hospital if it had not kept him from hell. Let us resolve to meditate more on the Bible. It is good to take with us two or three texts when we go out into the world and to turn them over and over in our mind whenever we have a little leisure time. It keeps our many vain thoughts. It keeps out many vain thoughts. It clenches the nail of daily reading. It preserves our souls from stagnating and breeding corrupt things. It sanctifies and quickens our memories and prevents them from becoming like those foul ponds where the reptiles live but the fish die. Let us resolve to talk more to believers about the Bible when we meet them. Alas, the conversation of Christians when they do meet is often sadly unprofitable. How many frivolous and trifling and uncharitable things are said? Let us bring out the Bible more and it will, be, it will help to drive away the devil. And let us keep our hearts in tune. Oh, that we may all strive so as to walk together in this evil world, that Jesus may often draw near and go with us as he went with the two disciples journeying to Emmaus. Last of all, let us resolve to live by the Bible more and more every year we live. Let us frequently take account of all our opinions and practices, all our habits and tempers, all our behavior in public and private, in the world, and by our own firesides. Let us measure all by the Bible and resolve by God's help to conform to it. Oh, that we may learn increasingly to cleanse our ways by the word. Psalm 119.9 I commend all these things to the serious and prayerful attention of everyone into whose hands this paper may fall. I want the ministers of my beloved country to be Bible-reading ministers, the congregations to be Bible-reading congregations, and the nation to be a Bible-reading nation. To bring about this desirable end, I cast my might into God's treasury. The Lord grant that it may prove not to have been in vain. And so here we are, about 150 years later, 
reading his words. May it continue to not be in vain in our lives. Hey, thanks for sticking with me as long as you have. I pray that you're reading your Bible today and you're preparing to start January 2nd on this great journey of developing a Bible reading habit. Again, let me know if I can help you. I've gone over a lot of advice here. I'm going to be glad to summarize it for you. Uh, please let me know. You can get in touch with me at the email you'll see on this video. Um, and if there's any other questions about anything you read in the Bible, you know that's one of my jobs. I'm here to help you work through those things so that you too can become a master of the Word, or better yet, so that you too can become mastered by the Word. May you be blessed. Look forward to seeing you soon. Jesus is everything. Amen.